What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to another dive into the EOS R5C. Now I know, I know, I haven't done a whole lot of technical content for the R5C and that's coming, trust me, I'm getting there. But I've had a couple of months of experience with my camera and I wanted to revisit the question of powering it in more detail now that I have made some decisions and have some practical experience with doing it. Now, I agonized over what to do about batteries and power supplies for weeks before I ended up making a decision. And I want to talk through a bit of my decision process, what and why I did some sort, why I did what I did, and some of the products that I found along the way that might be useful for some of you if you're looking at powering an R5C rig. Now, the way that I see it, there are three questions that you need to answer, answer for yourself if you're looking at external power for your R5C. And these are, what does the camera require and what is safe? Do I want to use USB power delivery or a DC coupler? And what kind of battery do I want to put behind all of this to power it? So first things first. If you're moving beyond Canon's OEM power solutions, and that's really what we're talking about here, you need to know how much power the camera requires and what voltages that it can safely handle. Now, unfortunately, Canon, Canon doesn't document this in the camera's specs, which would be really nice. They don't even tell us what the USB power delivery requirements are, which is really frustrating because that's an open industry standard that should just be uh, out there. So I had to figure out what was safe and what was required in kind of a roundabout way. Now for USB power delivery, that actually was pretty easy. If you plug your camera into a USB power delivery supply, battery, AC adapter, it doesn't matter, and the camera doesn't switch to USB PD mode, then the supply can't provide what the camera needs. And the good news is because the way power delivery works, it, nothing can be damaged in the process. So what you need for USB power delivery is a USB power delivery 2.0 or newer, so 3.0 will also work, power source that can output 27 watts or more on a single port. Now, thanks to the way that USB power delivery works, the available voltages and currents for any given power source are tied to the supply's rated output. And as a result, a 27 watt USB power delivery supply will provide the nine volts and three amps that the camera actually needs. Now, on the other hand, the DC path is, well, it's a bit more complicated. While DC is electrically simpler than USB power delivery, there's no circuits and control chips and logic and any of that kind of stuff going on, it does put a lot more burden on you to understand what you're doing and what's going on in the system. So this is what I know for certain. You can safely feed your camera between 6 and 8.4 volts through a dummy battery. Now these voltages come from both the voltage range of the LPE6 battery and Canon's own CA946 AC adapters output voltage. However, it's also potentially possible that the camera could tolerate as much as 9.45 volts in the somewhere. Now, this is the maximum that's allowed by the USB power delivery standard when a USB power delivery supply is operating in 9 volt mode. So I know the camera should be able to tolerate that on the USB-C port. What I don't know is if that translates to being able to tolerate it through the battery bay. Now, unfortunately, I'm too chicken to test that theory with my camera, so it's an outstanding question until somebody else does that. Now the actual power requirements are a bit more nebulous. So if we go off of what they require for USB power delivery, the camera requires 27 watts, which is provided as 3 amps at 9 volts. If it can't get that, the camera simply won't use USB power delivery. Now, additionally, if we look at the specs for Canon's CA946 AC adapter, it's rated for 31 watts, which is 3.7 amps at 8.4 volts. Now, on the other hand, I've measured the camera's current draw in various modes while recording and so forth. And much like what's in the back of the manual, I only saw 15 to 16 watts of draw in my tests. Moreover, the highest powered multifunction shoe device that's currently available, 
I didn't have anything in the multifunction shoe when I did my tests is Tascam's XLR recorder, a two channel jobby. And according to the specifications for that, that should only add a maximum of two more watts to the power requirement. So 17 to 18 watts total. Now that said, current is pulled by the device, not pushed by the power supply. So it's perfectly fine to have a power supply that's rated for more current than the device requires. But if you go the other way around, the device will trip the overcurrent or overheat and damage the power supply if the device withdraws more power than the supply is rated to provide. So what do we take away from all of this? Well, the safe answer is to aim for a power supply that can deliver 30 watts and do so one way or another at a voltage between 7 and 8.4 volts is where you ideally want to be. You'll probably be okay if your power supply can produce or can only produce a bit less than that, maybe as little as 20 watts. That would still give you some overhead based on the measurements that I've made in practical shooting. But obviously, I can't guarantee that that situation will work. In any event, you can largely ignore all of this complicated electrical stuff if you go with USB power delivery. So speaking of USB power delivery, let's talk about the camera to battery connection. Now again, I'm going to start with USB power because it's easier. The biggest advantage of using USB power delivery is that it takes all the stress out of figuring out what cables you need, regulators, what plug sizes, etc., and voltages, of course. To connect the camera to any compatible USB power delivery power supply, all you need is a Type-C to Type-C USB cable. In fact, any cable will do since the R5C doesn't draw enough power to require the new special high current USB cables, so pretty much anything should work. Now, I have several that I've used, 10 long ones, short ones, etc. But on my actual rig, I use this Poikot, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, one foot cable that I found on Amazon. Now, what I like about this specific cable is that its end fits very snugly in Canon's port protector, and so I don't have to worry about it getting unplugged or going anywhere. If you're going to do USB power delivery, you also need an LPE6 series battery in the camera so that the camera can turn on, boot up, and configure the power delivery settings with the source. Any LPE6 series battery will work. However, only the N and NH variants can be recharged in the camera when you turn it off. Now, one good thing is that thanks to this battery, the camera can both seamlessly fail over from USB power delivery to the internal battery. So, for example, if the cord gets bumped and disconnected or the external battery dies, as well as have the LPE6 battery replaced. So if it's dead while you're shooting, you can pop it out, plug a new one in and keep going. And this can all be done while the camera is recording without any interruption. Now, finally, I consider USB PD to be just a little bit safer. Put simply, there's a lot that goes into making USB PD safe and compatible across manufacturers. From testing and certification to the design of the systems as a whole, simple things, high voltages just aren't dumped into the device the moment it's connected, the same way that a DC connection just provides voltage. Now, of course, the other option is to use a DC coupler or dummy battery. Now, the DC coupler removes the camera's battery from the equation and replaces it with, obviously, the DC coupler itself, and then whatever battery is on the other end of the DC coupler's cord that it's plugged into. Now, some people will certainly see this as an advantage, since you don't have to worry about a battery in the camera dying when you're out in the field or whatever, or at having a battery in the camera at all. However, balancing that advantage, there really are some disadvantages here. Now, the big one is that the R5C has a new higher power requirement compared to the R5 or other EOS mirrorless cameras in general. Uh, the short of it is that shooting at 60 frames per second in full frame mode with XLR power and autofocus enabled, the camera just can't get enough power from an LPE6 battery to satisfy all of those current power requirements. In this case, what, acts, what a camera will end up doing is disabling some of the functions, specifically autofocus and XLR power through the hot shoe, to reduce the power used and protect the battery. Now, that's 
battery. So the question maybe that you're thinking is, why is this a problem for a DC coupler? Well, like batteries, DC couplers tell the camera what they are. And if the camera doesn't recognize the DC coupler as one that's compatible or capable of providing the power the camera needs, then it will continue to enforce the lower power limits. So for example, if a DC coupler like this one from Blind Spot Gear identifies itself as an LPE6 battery, as this one does, then the camera treats it as such because it has no way to know any better that it's really not a battery. So the short of it is simple. If you need the R5C's full 8K 60 frame per second capabilities with all the bells and whistles, and you want to go with a DC coupler, you need to use the right one. And as far as I can tell, right now, the right one is only Canon's DRE6C DC coupler. Now, of course, nothing is stopping you from using an older DC coupler. Again, like this one, it works fine for the vast majority of the camera's recording modes, just not the highest end 60 frame per second one. You'll get a warning when you try to use it. Now, my other concern with DC couplers is voltage regulation and protection. And it may simply be that I don't have enough experience with enough DC couplers and I haven't taken enough apart to know what exactly is going on. But the simple reality is, is I don't want to fry my camera. And looking at how DC couplers appear to work, they can make it much easier to do that accidentally. Now, this isn't a concern if your DC coupler advertises that it either provides power regulation internally or over voltage protection. So for example, Anton Bauer makes a PTAP to LPE6 battery adapter, and that battery adapter includes built-in voltage regulation. So it's designed to be plugged directly into a 14.4 volt PTAP port, and obviously the R5C can't take 14.4 volts, so the coupler itself steps that down to 8 or 7 or something in that range that the camera can take. However, most DC couplers aren't designed for input voltages that high, and as far as I can tell, most don't even advertise if they have overvoltage protection circuits or anything in there to protect your camera. Now, the other part of the DC coupler equation is power regulation. Most DC couplers don't include power regulation and can't be plugged directly into a high voltage port on a battery. Now this is especially true if you're using big cinema style batteries that output 14.4 volts. Now there are a host of options here, far more than I can cover in any detail. Now these include things like batteries with integrated voltage regulators so there's a eight volt port on the battery that you could just plug in to battery mounts that do this voltage regulation to inline voltage regulators that you plug into a battery p-tap port and then plug your coupler into that uh, you can even find voltage regulators that plug into usb power delivery like this one and provide camera safe voltages or battery voltages out of that the important thing, regardless of what way you go, is to make sure that whatever regulator you do choose gives enough or can provide enough power for the R5C's maximum power needs. So that about covers getting power into the camera. Now the question is, how do you store that power? So let's talk about batteries. Now this is where I ran into the most consternation in this whole process. I really wanted to find a solution that was both cost effective and upgradable in a way that I could take as much if, as possible along with me to what I ultimately expected or at least hoped would be cinema style batteries at some point either down the road or whatever. What I ended up doing was far less Hollywood and far more YouTube. So when it comes to batteries you have three broad options. You can go the consumer route with USB power delivery battery packs. You can go the middle-ish video route with Sony NPF series batteries, or you can go full Hollywood and dive into the world of cinema batteries. So let's start with USB power delivery. 
Given the camera's power requirements, you'll need a USB battery pack capable of providing 27 watts on a single port. Now, to get this much, a good place to start looking at is batteries that advertise as being compatible or capable of fast charging a decent sized laptop. Think MacBook Pro sized. Now, the good news is that most of these batteries also tend to have 80 to 90 watt hours of capacity, so you can expect run times in the four to six hour range when shooting with them. Now, the pros of USB power delivery battery packs are pretty short, really. They're simple and self-contained. You only need a USB-C cable to get going, and you might not even need to buy another charger as most of these batteries can slow charge overnight from any USB charger or quick charge in a couple of hours with a USB power delivery charger, and you might already have one of those for your laptop or tablet. Now, on the other hand, these batteries, they're not designed to integrate into a camera rig. Now, this doesn't mean that there's a problem electrically. What it means is that they don't have threaded sockets or rail mounts or quick release connectors or anything like that built in or a large ecosystem of products that are designed to easily add that to them. So you're going to need to find, to find a mounting solution for your battery on your rig. Now, in digging, I did find a couple of small rig power bank holders that might be useful for some of you. They're parts number, or part numbers 2790 and BUB 2336. However, my battery ended up not being able to fit in the 2790, which I think is the larger of the two. So I had to DIY a solution with a cheese plate and some red whips and a cinch strap and a quick release connector that I happen to already have. The USB batteries also aren't easily expandable. So unlike the simple DC world of like cinema camera batteries, you can't just plug a, a splitter or distribution block into a USB port on the battery and have more ports to plug things into. So as a result, you'll need to pick a battery that has enough ports to cover your needs. Now, personally, I found four is pretty much super good enough. Three would also be entirely doable, but less than that, and you really get down to just being able to power your camera and nothing else, which maybe that's all you need, but I like having some options. Now, the other sort of broad option or path are to go with cinema-style batteries. So I'm talking about the stuff that uses Anton Bauer's Gold or Sony's V-mounts, and to a much lesser extent, the Sony NPF series batteries. So I'll start with the MPF batteries, largely because they're not, I think, the best. I don't think they're the best option to go with. Now, odds are good you already have some of these NPF series batteries lying around. So, you know, I use them for lights and things like that, on-camera monitors, audio recorders. There's tons of stuff that use them. So it may seem like a really smart idea to leverage them to power your R5C. Uh, this is especially true since there are several products that are marketed for powering hybrid cameras that are designed to use those batteries. And some of these are even calling out the R5C as a target camera specifically because of the power issues that it has when recording. Now, some of the advantages of going this route include basically, well, leveraging batteries that you already have potentially, and the smaller size of NPF batteries compared to full-size cinema camera batteries. And another advantage is that NPF batteries typically aren't as expensive as full-size cinema batteries are, especially if you're not buying the Sony first-party ones. And in some cases, you can even find them cheaper than USB battery packs. Now, on the other hand, there are some downsides to this route as well. So to start with, you will need to use a dummy battery and you will need to buy a battery plate to mount to the battery to get the power out of it. While there are NPF adapters that have USB PD ports, I haven't found any that meet the magic 27 watt number that the R5C requires. However, there are a ton out there. So if you know of one that does actually provide 27 watts on the USB port as an output and is compatible with the R5C, let me know in the comments below. And of course, you'll need to check the power limits for the battery adapter you choose to ensure that the camera won't overload it. 
and actually for that matter the battery so if you're using an NPF 500 series battery the little ones they're roughly equivalent to the LPE6 batteries that Canon uses they probably shouldn't be loaded any more than an LPE6 battery would be now, as I discussed earlier, you can probably get away with a lower current rating than what Canon seems to require for USB power delivery if you're doing the dummy battery route, yada, 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 yada. Now, that leaves us with the big guns, the world of proper cinema style batteries, full Hollywood. So obviously we're talking about the likes of Anton Bauer's gold and V-mount connectors. And I'd also include the new REB mount in that list, except it's pretty new. I haven't seen an awful lot that uses it, and it's largely targeted at very high-end cameras, not so much everything else. And, you know, I'll be honest, I really wanted to go this route, though I can't articulate a good reason why. Maybe it was just because it was Hollywood. There are definitely some advantages going this way, though, but there are some drawbacks, and those drawbacks can be significant, especially if you're a small operation. So to start with, one advantage, and probably the biggest advantage, is that these batteries have the capacity to give you all-day power for an entire rig in one battery. So where NPF and USB battery packs typically max out at around 90 to 100 watt hours, it is not hard to find cinema batteries with capacities of 250 or even 300 watt hours. At 300 watt hours, that's enough to power an R5C alone for close to 20 hours of continuous operation or an entire camera rig, so the camera, a monitor, mics, audio recorders, and even small on-camera lights for six to eight hours of continuous shooting. Now that said, there are also compact cinema batteries in the 50 to 90 watt hour range as well, so you aren't just limited with a massive boat anchor of a battery all the time. That said, speaking of big batteries, one thing to keep in mind with these is that if you do fly, there are a lot of limits or there are limits on the size of lithium ion batteries that you can carry with you on a plane. So to start with, and this is at the airline's discretion, if your battery is between 100 and 160 watt hours, you can only carry a maximum of two batteries on. They have to be in your carry-on luggage, and the, you, so you can't have them in the uh, check bags and obviously if they're in your carry-on luggage they're taking up gear that could be used by cameras or lenses additionally batteries larger than 160 watt hour capacity at least lithium-ion batteries that are larger than 160 watt hour capacity are not permitted on aircraft at all and this is pretty universal it's enforced by the FAA, the European equivalent of that, etc. It's not an airline thing, so don't try... You're not going to find an airline that gets around this unless maybe it's a private charter flight. Now, another advantage is that you don't have to worry about power or current limits that from these batteries. These batteries are designed to power substantial loads, like huge stuff, like 100 plus watt lights or cameras that draw that much power and even a small cine style battery such as an Anton Bauer Titan 45 micro so it's only a 45 watt hour battery it's really only about the same capacity as this battery here can supply 8 amps or 115 watts continuously where this battery is maybe a quarter of that if that and of course, the big ones, the 250s and 300s, they can do more than twice that in terms of power. There's also a world of accessories built around making sure cinema cameras don't go down in the middle of a shoot due to a dead battery. So for example, you can find multi-battery plates where you can have three, four, two, three, four, whatever batteries mounted to a camera at a time. You can also, and those plates and other plates are hot, often hot swap capable. So you can have two batteries and when one gets low, you can swap it off, put a fully charged one and keep going that way. Now, finally, many of these batteries and battery plates also have multiple power outputs built in using DTAP or other industry standard connectors. 
And of course, there's a lot in the cinema world of DTAP to you know whatever kind of connector you need for DC devices. So ultimately, there's potentially a bit less faffing around trying to power other things on your rig if you're using one of these batteries. Moreover, most of the ancillary gear that you probably are gonna have on your camera, so an on-camera light or an on-camera monitor, it's are typically designed to accept the 14.4 volts that these batteries produce, you know, unregulated, they, they can just deal with it. Now, all that said, the downsides here can be quite steep. The big one, I think, is probably cost. These batteries can run for two, from $200 for a small 40 to 50 watt hour model from not a huge, well-respected, highly reputable manufacturer to more than $1,000 per unit in the case of those like 250 and 300 watt hour batteries. And in most cases, on top of that, you still are going to need to buy a mounting plate uh, or hardware. You're going to need to buy a power regulator and so on and so forth. Now, rigging these batteries also could be potentially a bit more awkward. Although, truth be told, mounting any of these batteries to an R5C is not exactly the most elegant thing in the world. Now, while there are plenty of options available for mounting these batteries, the typical use or, or, or uh, yeah, the typical way that they're used or mounted is either to click them into the battery connector on the back of a much larger cinema camera, or put a battery plate behind the cinema camera and mount, uh, mount it on 15 or 19 millimeter rods. And you could certainly do that with the R5C, but you're going to block the LCD and the EVF. And it might not, it, it, the camera's just really not quite shaped for that kind of setup. You'll also obviously need some kind of power adapter to get the voltages done right for the R5C one way or another. So if you go the DC coupler route, we're talking about either a battery plate with a power regulator or an inline DTAP power regulator that can step down the voltage to what your camera needs. So for example, I talked about Anton Bauer's PTAP to LPE6 battery. It has a built-in voltage regulator. Uh, another route, so to speak, or another example is something like Small Rig's V-mount adapter plate 3203, which again has built-in voltage regulators for camera power. Going the USB power delivery route, I found that two products bridge the gap between cinema batteries and USB power delivery quite nicely. These are the, the least expensive of these options that I've found is Tether Tools on-site DTAP to USB-C PD adapter. Uh, it plugs into a DTAP port, provides you with a USB-C output. It's kind of kind of nifty. Alternatively, if more cables aren't really to your liking, Wrencher Industries makes a power block 90 watt USB-C to PD battery mount adapter and that mounts directly to the battery's quick release connector and internal uh, power option or power connection. Now, all that said, one option that wasn't on the market when I was setting up my rig is Small Rig's new VB series batteries of V-mount uh, batteries. These were just announced recently. I believe they go on sale in September or October of this year. And they're available in 50, 99, and 150 watt hour capacities. So, you know, pretty reasonable sizes, easily stuff that you can fly with, etc. And they're priced pretty reasonably, at least for cinema camera batteries. The important thing here, though, is that they include an internal USB power delivery output and one that can provide power for the R5C. Moreover, unlike a lot of the other batteries that can only be charged with through the DTAP port or the battery's mount, these can also be charged through the USB PD port, so you may not have to even buy another charger. So, with all of that said, what did I do? Well, like I said, I went more YouTube than Hollywood, and I decided to go with USB power delivery across the board. So, I had several reasons for this. First of which is that I like the redundancy of the internal battery. And in fact, this has saved my bacon more than a few times already as I have forgotten to recharge my external battery and the internal battery, it dies in the middle of shooting and the internal battery just picks up the slack like a champ. 
I also like that USB power delivery is a standard that has a huge consumer electronics ecosystem around it. So while it may be new to powering cinema cameras, a lot of the ancillary stuff we already also need, like our laptops, use it. And as a result, I'm finding that there's a growing number of products that are designed to bridge the gap between cinema batteries and USB power delivery devices. So it's not like there isn't room to grow into cinema batteries going USB PD. More importantly, USB PD just seems safer to me. I don't have to worry about accidentally plugging my camera's USB cable into the wrong port. If the camera and power supply can't agree on the right power profile, nothing happens. Now, granted, that might mean I don't have power, but quite honestly, I find that's a lot better of a problem to have than a fried camera. Finally, USB power delivery just fits well with the rest of my gear. I can use the same chargers and batteries that I would use to power my camera rig to power or recharge basically everything else I need to work in the field. Laptop, tablet, phone, etc. And ultimately, this means that I can carry less, which is always a plus when you're traveling and flying. So specifically, I bought Anchor's 747 power bank kit. This is a PowerCore 26K for laptop batteries and an Anchor 65 watt USB PD charger. Now buying that got me a 96 watt hour battery, which means I don't have to worry about traveling with it as it's under that 100 watt hour limit. So there's basically no restrictions on it. And it also is big enough to get me a good five to six hours of continuous shooting with the R5C in the field. It also has four ports. Two of them are USB-C and two of them are USB-A. And this is enough to power simultaneously basically everything I need to shoot either in the studio or in the field. And in fact, I've used it to power simultaneously my camera on a C to C cable, my tablet with an A to C cable acting as a teleprompter monitor, my Zoom F6 audio recorder, again with another A to C cable since it doesn't actually draw a lot of power, and a small rig HD monitor or a small HD monitor using that blind spot gear USB power delivery converter and dummy battery I showed earlier. And of course, to recharge it, I simply use any of the many USB char PD chargers I already have from the one that came with it to the one that came with my MacBook Pro laptop. So I hope that helps shed some light on some of the thoughts and options for powering an R5C and what products you might want to look into if you're trying to figure this out for yourself. If you found this useful or just interesting, let me know by hitting that like button and sharing it. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.